all for one family on stage. Their first gig, The Cars. It didn't go in that we could actually be meeting our producer or that this could be a major record year for us. If you feel the emotion in every song, you give across the emotion of the song. You have been a wonderful audience and we will remember this. We will be back. When you're put in a situation where you have to perform, where you have to deliver, no matter what, something happens. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it because we love it. Hi, I'm Kieran Tanham. I produced and directed Something Else in the Meantime documentary. This is Causecast. Hi, and welcome to episode 13 of Causecast. In this episode, we speak with cinematographer and documentary maker Kieran Tanham. Kieran is best known for his work with the band on the Love to Love You music video, and also producing the documentary Something Else in the Meantime. Sections of Kieran's work were also featured in the All the Way Home documentary. I reached out to Kieran because I thought it would be so wonderful to finally get to hear what it was like to be behind the camera, witnessing the band develop from the early 90s into the stadium-filling band they later became. I really hope you enjoy this insider's insight into the band's historic rise to success. Enjoy. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and speak about your... I have to say, with within the fan communities, your work is incredibly mm-hmm. iconic and recognised. I don't know yeah. if you know that. Anybody that's a fan of the band for, for any amount of time, the documentary you worked on and mm. the segments that were then used for the Love to Love You video, etc., which mm. we'll discuss in further, is so well-loved. It is mm. honestly, good. it is richly received and repeatedly worn out watched um, yeah, good. By, by so <laughs> many. It, I had to at least ask if you would be willing to chat and discuss yeah. this part of your career and your work. Um, so yeah. thank you for agreeing. It's really kind yeah. of Yeah, no, no bother. Yeah, if, yeah, I was, because I was there from the beginning with them, you know, and through their manager, John Hughes, who was one of my oldest buddies, who we went to school together when we were four years old. And then we went to secondary school together and we lived close by each other and we, just and still do. I'll see John next week, probably, and um, a couple of weeks ago. So we're we're still very close friends, and uh, we've been on that journey. He invited me in on the journey at a really early stage. Uh, so I've spent for the last twenty years with the cores everywhere around the planet. So that's yeah. I'm not jealous at all. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I try and start each interview or at least each episode discussing the background of the person I'm speaking with and how they got to the point where they were working with the cause. How did it come to about, I mean, we're talking about the documentary, something else in the meantime, yeah, which I believe was released on St. Patrick's day in 1998. I, right. think, I believe that was its airing day. I think around that time. Yeah. 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 What, what was your first experience of meeting the band? But before that, how did you get to the point where you were working in that type of industry and with that kind of background beforehand? How did that start for you? Okay, I I was always interested in film and of things and music, of course, because uh, I had a sound studio myself and I played music with John Hughes, their manager, and he and I and his brother and from others who we all lived in the same area, we played in a band together. Uh, Mind you, they went on and formed a more uh, successful band. I was more interested in film and that kind of thing. So I headed in. I used to hang around with the band, his band, John Hughes' band, and his brother and those guys, their friends, and take photographs and do all that. So I was, we were always together doing that kind of thing. And obviously then later on, when John met Ros Herbert and at the audition for the commitments and that story of the course is well known where that's where they met and John was suggested that John become their manager and he suggested of course that they should have him as their manager and which is the best thing that happened to both of those people mm-hmm. and there they got together so then John was um, starting off with the band and he tells the story of them meeting them for the first time and they were actually in school uniforms which he was shocked by because he didn't realize that yeah. some of them were still at school and then uh, a little while after that when they began to 
formed the band and practiced and thing, uh, John just said to me one day, uh, what do you think, should we start to film something here? Could it be, would it be worthwhile doing some coverage as this band begins to get off the road? So uh, that's where I became involved with the cores at that time. So they were very new and they were still just rehearsing in studios and they had no albums done or anything. And uh, we, st I started to film their journey, which I think was seven years later, had I known at that time, it was maybe seven years later to shoot that story. And um, well, I still would have done it anyway, of course, but uh, that's how it began for me. So it was through John Hughes, their manager, asking me, would I come and film some work with them? And we just carried on forever. Wow. So, and that was it, really. That's how it started, yeah. I, I had so, no idea that you were the person behind the camera in those early days. Obviously, I've seen that. I know the footage mm. so well. It's yeah. Fran's lifeblood. It really is. is you know, the mm. early stuff scouring over what they created and how they affected and brought that music together and that mix and that blend. Yeah. I assumed it would have been a family member. I know I've heard reports in the past and through Andrea's memoirs that in the early days, mm. in certain aspects, they they filmed themselves using their uh, Jerry's hand cam and stuff like That's that. Right. Um, but then I could tell from other footage that that was professionally shot with them with really yeah. good equipment. And that was you, you the whole time. I was there. Yeah, I had been working in television documentary and filming. I am a DOP with a director of photography is my what I do now. And uh, I had always had a camera. So I had a uh, reasonably good cameras and in the early days it is true they did film themselves and a lot of their very early footage in their bedrooms and everything they would have filmed up themselves uh i but I, I was there when they were having discussion about should they bring a drummer into the band or not and caroline said i could give that a go and i remember filming that caroline decided she'd play the drums and she just started to play we thought that filmed at the time that's how early on in the career i was involved in yeah. so that's yeah. incredible yeah. yeah i have i have endless footage that no one has ever seen of the course um it's never been seen anywhere and and yeah reams reams of it you were there at the beginning where they were just still hashing out ideas let alone anything else what yeah you, what was it like to hear those first was it just like any other are oh, there some kids making some music or did did you know they had something like straight away you could tell straight away that they were terrific musicians each individually uh at down times between rehearsing songs jim would just play something on the piano uh amazing stuff uh caroline would step up and play the piano as well then each of them would play and they could all, they were all really good individual uh, musicians in their own right. Mm. And not just in traditional Irish music, which they played a lot, but they were really good and still are really good individual musicians. And you could tell that at a very early stage. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. And, it, and that's from somebody who's more interested in pictures than in sound. Sure, sure. But you'd been, you know, you'd been around uh, John and his brother's band and seen the success they'd had um, mm. globally. Um, yep. So it's not like you hadn't recognised music talent or in enjoyable music before then and mm. you could see that there was something there. It's lovely. Oh, yeah, you could tell straight away. Yeah, there was no question about it. They had the talent. I think it's what David Foster spotted immediately, that kind of charisma and the talent to play those instruments. There's a lot of bands don't do that, you know. They they all backing track, and it's but each of those guys could actually do what you're listening to. Exactly, it's it's actual music played by yeah. raw passion and talent. Mm. And yeah, oh, it's yep. incredible. It's incredible. Mm. Was it odd being with them in that kind of in some of those development stages? Was it a case of they would work on something and then oh, the occasional Friday you'd pop in with a camera, or is it a case yeah. of was it really as as kind of Ad lib as that. It was as ad lib as that. It was a real uh, John and the band would uh, decide they're going to rehearse something or they're going to try out a new place. And uh, what are you doing, Karen? Can you are you around? And I would drop in and I would film certain moments along the way. They'd be rehearsing in a factory in Dublin or something, and I'd just go in and just fill, I'd turn up, film. I'd be free, wouldn't be shooting another project. And that's the way it was for a lot of the 
film coverage we did, but there were specific times where it was orchestrated that I would come in because they were going to there was something special going on, like a special rehearsal, or maybe they were going to bring in some other aspect to the rehearsal and they want, we wanted to film it. But there were events, you know, they maybe mm. I was I was there when they were signing their contracts for the first time ah, in John's yeah. house and in the garden and all that. That was kind of, I knew that was going to happen. Sure. So we had arranged. So a certain amount was arranged and a certain amount was that. I, I, because I was one of John's close friends at the time, I was kind of free just to walk in. I had a, I had a VIP pass <laughs> to his kitchen yeah. and to his, to his living room and to his back garden. So uh, you could just arrive and it was great. Yeah. I think it's that level of trust that's really obviously allowed you the ability to film, but also mm. it's come across in how carefree they are. Yeah. You know, it's not like they oh, got, we're yeah. playing for the camera now. It's, oh no, we're, we're just amongst friends. We're, we've all got this, we've all got the same hope. Um, yeah. This is all part of that hope that this one day yeah. will be, will be the norm, you know? Yeah. We had a small camera and I kept it small at the time. I would have been, filming documentaries with bigger, you know, booms and tripods and bigger mm. format cameras and everything. But with the band in the early days, I just used a small camera. So it was less obtrusive than they got used to just having this guy hanging around pointing this thing at them. And you became invisible after a while. And that was really good because they just act naturally. And I always promised that there'd be nothing, no, none of this bad stuff would be used. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, you lie all the time. You of know, course. that. like in, yeah. in this podcast, you're only going to use the good bits. I know that. Yeah, yeah, so only the good bits. We lie, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so yeah, so it was very easy, and they were very easy too, and very relaxed with it. So it was great. Yeah. Oh, do you recall which camera you used? Oh, I had a little Panasonic P2 or P1 or something like that uh, camera. It was a small little hand handheld camera, flip out screen, and. Uh, very immediate. Uh, all the sound was on a little microphone just on top of the camera. Oh, wow. uh, I, did, I didn't bring along booms and sound people, a sound person with me till we were doing uh, more serious stuff, you know. So it was yeah. just me on my own, really, yeah. And that's the way it was with, with David Foster, and he just doesn't allow cameras in his studio. And uh, I said, sure, I've only got a little camera here, David, you'll be fine. And uh, he said, OK, come on, come on, come on. And he, I filmed a lot of their working out in L.A. in Santa Monica in his studio because uh, and he doesn't like that normally. But mm. I got I got in there and you, you have you learn to be invisible. And that's the trick. Yeah. And you watch it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm. We, we were in a car. We had come out of David Foster's studio. We were on the way home. John. Uh, John got a call and said, this guy, Oliver Lieber, has just finished up on a track. We should go and listen to it. And I remember there was kind of a silence because the guys were tired. And somebody said, we should go and listen to it. And we went out to Oliver Lieber's studio. And he was a funky looking guy with his little ponytail and tattoos and a lot. And we walked in there and he put on this track and it was Dreams and it was incredible. Yeah. And everyone just sat and listened to that for the first time uh, on that night at about midnight after a long day with Foster. And everyone knew there was something special there. Yeah. And I think I remember John the next day saying, what am I going to say to David Foster that this guy has come up with this track that's better than your tracks? You know, so um, it was a little bit of that feeling and it was incredible. But I was just a fly on the wall in the background. If you asked John or the band to say I wasn't even there, they probably wouldn't yeah. even remember. But it was amazing, an amazing time. And I, we all knew that track from our lives beforehand. But uh, that guy was special. He was really good. Yeah. I think it was a magical moment in there. Yeah. Uh, that, that track. Yeah. yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. The mm. UK radio play alone, that was, that was the breaking mm. of the UK. That and the Royal Albert Hall gig was yeah. just, yeah. yeah. So there you are. It's mm. commitments have happened. I've spoken with um, G. Mark Roswell, who helped basically do their um, first development deal. Uh, yeah. Gave them their first £100,000 so that Jim could move mm. back from Dublin to the mm. gatehouse. It's so interesting to hear from his point of view what, what went on, but also that 
their first gig was a showcase gig for a number of bands, not just them on their own. To your recollection, were you there to, I'm assuming you recorded the gig. We did film it. I think I asked someone else to film that because I wasn't available at that time. I think I did another early performance of the band in Whelan's pub in Dublin. That was one of their early shows they made on. Yeah, Yeah, that was their first professional solo showcase gig where... Is that uh, it? Okay. um, Gene Kennedy Smith was present, which led them to the US. Yep, That's, that's correct, yep. And at the National Stadium in Dublin, they performed there and she was influential, influential in all of that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Incredible. Watched it back through um, a couple of days ago in preparation for this interview. And mm. it, it it's kind of amazing to see how many gigs were recorded back then. And obviously, yeah. I'm just going into discussing sort of the tour and the promotion side of the album. Yeah. How on earth many gigs in how many countries were you mm-hmm. a part of? Were you just part of the team that went round with them and then you were filming when you were available? Or No, there was periods where I knew that they were going to go off on tour and then I would just make that a part of my time to be available to do that. So all around Ireland in the early days, there were many gigs they played and I filmed nearly all of those and we put together a, a friend of mine, Mark Quinn, who had his own online editing suite. He put together a compilation of all those gigs that they did. And the crowd reaction in those uh, gigs was really good. And then that video was a short video sent off to, I think it was Warner Music. And they saw this and they said, oh, my God, this band seems to be kicking up a bit of a storm in Ireland and they saw that and they then decided to ask me if I would direct one of their videos and they sent me a check and said do you think you could do it for this money and I said I think I could do it for that money and we did love to love you just out of them seeing all the footage that I had shot previously of them performing live with my little camera with my little mic and everything and that's uh, that's how that came about wow it must have been the, the how captivating the footage was which it really was having mm. it really captured the feel of those early days and those that early fan reaction to a, mu- a type of music that hadn't been heard before and it was yeah you know the youth of that generation are adoring it clearly adoring it and taking them and celebrating them as their own as irish which mm. is clearly seen in the footage and have a big warm welcome home for the court. The sums of money that were and the types of directors that were asked and producers that were asked for the other music mm. videos it's really mm. yeah the love to love you kind of sticks out because it uses that tour kind of scale and that tour of lens and view to 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 give yeah. an idea and a flavor of what the band are doing at the time that they're up and coming that they're busy that they mm. are performing live and to hear that the record company just went oh yeah can you can you then make the music video had you done mm. Had you done music videos prior to that? I hadn't done music video. I'd shot a lot of stuff and I directed a few small things, but mm. I hadn't done that. But you see, other directors had to deal with it differently because they would be approached by the record company to make the video for the next song. Yeah. And then they would only have the band available for three or four days. So they had to do the studio type videos for them, which is understandable. But I just happened to have three and four years of material already in the can that I said, why don't we use this instead of doing something? We did go on to the JFK uh, warship, which was controversial at the time. Very but we went on there and uh, and that was Gene Kennedy Smith uh, who organized all that. So that was an opportunity we couldn't miss. Yeah. So we used a little bit of that footage in the video to do that. But generally, we just thought the live performance of the band was probably something that would be a bit different in a video than just another. There would be many studio videos being made in the future. We kind of guessed that. So 
So that's how that came about. But uh, yeah. So. yeah. Um, are you able to disclose how much they were offering to pay you or paid you to do the video? What was the budget like? I know, no problem. I, they paid uh, forty-seven thousand uh, dollars at the time, which was these days wouldn't buy you the tape to put in the camera or buy you the oh. film. To, it was nothing. It yeah. was it was pittance really but it just came out of the blue and we said we'd do it so and a lot of the footage i had but it was it was i mean they'll pay three hundred thousand dollars for videos nowadays for oh, bands yeah. at that scale you know and plus so uh no so there's nothing but that's what it cost at that time cool to, many years ago is that and I did they my... did they send over a like a brief of what they kind of wanted to see no they just said, they "Here's said money. Do it. Do it. Yeah, we like what we saw. Can you do it? It was as simple as that. They weren't around, and we did it. And I did it, and we sent it back. And it had a couple of incarnations, and added a few things to it. And John uh, Hughes, of course, was very much involved. John is a hands-on person. Yeah. He's really good ideas, and he is for the band. Every decision he makes is for the band. And uh, we changed a few things in it, and." Was it so? Anything that comes to mind of those changes while I've got your mind on that? Because obviously, as as the fans, we'd we'd love to know mm. what's changed and and the reasoning behind it and and things like that. But any anything that comes to mind? Nothing particular. But uh, we were always conscious of the look of the girls. I mean, they're gorgeous, and Jim is gorgeous too, of course. But uh, so you always um, want to make sure that they are seen in the best light. So any close-ups or any details that aren't good or any moments that aren't suitable. So we were very particular about the the image of the band. Uh, pretty girls, great musicians. Uh, so you could have, John and the band could have done many roles and many images for that band. Oh, yeah. But it was always a very clean, uh, good solid respectable image that was there for the band all the time and john was very conscious of that that no one would take advantage of such good looking yeah, band yeah. you know if you know what i mean so it was always very always very controlled yeah yeah and i guess yeah you'll be like oh that's that shot might lead to that or this shot might yeah might suppose this or this could be used yeah. and constrained in this way so let's completely just kill it dead and then we'll just yeah. use this instead and L less less was always more i think was yeah. the feeling yeah less was more and that's how it worked all through uh the image making but they had some great stylists and makeup artists around too to to look after them so uh but there was nothing no there was nothing nothing bad there was never any disagreement as far as i can remember it was always just worked yeah 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 work works for work's sake mm. Mm. um so love to love you we've obviously got the 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 beginnings of the tour footage 1996 and before part of the love to love you video also has clips of them in what looks to be some kind of set very dark with them in f full makeup etc and that the aspect ratio oh, yeah. of the clips are very different mm. compared to the ship clips mm. have you had any understanding of yes. those clips they, yeah, I filmed those. Uh, I did those as a one-off for that Love to Love You video, knowing that I was going to use a lot of the existing pre-years footage of them performing, and rather than just have the ship uh, as the other mm. imagery, uh, I knew then that the Barry McCall video shoot, we kind of gate-crashed that because I knew Barry had some lovely lighting because Barry's brilliant and uh, and the costumes were bright and colourful and all of that. So I was able to take advantage of using parts of that, parts of the ship, parts of this. And I just thought we'd go and do one section where we just saw close-ups that were reasonably nicely lit. And just another device, really, Simon, to, to move the video along, really. That was it. So we shot those. I shot in a small studio somewhere. I can't remember where it was, but it was very simple. Very simple, yeah. So it was like a full run through mime to the track again, and then you took the, the elements you wanted and then mixed them in, yeah? Stan, I remember doing so these columns in background, foreground, very simply lit. Uh, just sing, each of you guys just sing the song. 
mime to this once or twice, end of story, goodbye, we're gone. Yeah, that's what it was. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's the biggest crowd. Money's out there, 2,000. It's Dublin. It's... It's... It's scary. <laughs> I can't even speak. Carla, come on, talk to them. Yeah, it's just you got. We have to wait till we get up there. You know, beforehand, it's just you're waiting around. You're, you know, doing your thing. But uh, it's a really big point in our career, a really main point in our career, because we've been working on this for like six years, and um, now we're playing in the stadium in Dublin, in the capital city, and 2,500 people. I mean, it, it's a lot, and it's great that we've sold all those tickets and sold them so quickly. It's wonderful. <laughs> This band has sold half a million records in the last five months. A platinum of gold in ten countries. Welcome to this next song especially for a very special person who's in the audience tonight and a special friend of ours ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith <laughs> You know, before we got on, it was like, you know, we really, we have to show it here. We really had to prove it here in Dublin. I just, we just feel that, you know. And um, it was so warm and it was so lovely. But people it felt like just going from the very beginning. It was the best yet. mention uh, the wonderful Barry McCall how did that come about that was the studio uh I mean it's, what's the studio big warehouse with a roof that keeps the rain out you know? yeah. so, uh, <laughs> photographers photographers don't need to think about sound so they can choose anywhere so I think that was in some kind of warehouse in Dublin that uh we just that Barry would have organized the set and that and it would have been John and Barry and the team of hair and costume and design organized that I said, I'm just going to get crushed this and shoot. But we were together. We knew we were going to do this together. So, um, and Barry didn't mind being filmed and being put into the video too, because his ego is bigger than mine, you know? So he's, uh, he didn't mind at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, he was very helpful on the day because sometimes when you're doing those kind of things, photographers don't want anyone around you know, yeah, getting yeah. in the way because they because they had a certain time to do it with the band and everything. But it was great. I remember that day. Well, it was good fun. Actually, the band were had they had a ball because it was mad. What he was asking to do was a bit crazy and sit this way and do that and smile and don't smile. But uh, he was it was good. So yeah, I just filmed around him really for that. Yeah, in a in a little studio in a little warehouse somewhere in Dublin. Yeah, yeah. He comes across as uh, really jolly and and wonderful. So. Yeah, yeah. It, you definitely he, it. That's why he's so popular. He's so good, and he makes he makes the atmosphere really good when he's doing his work, and people love that about him. You know, puts you at ease. Yeah. We've also got set pieces on the warship, um, which are mimed. They played live on the warship. They did. They, they did a concert, a, didn't they? They do it. They did a full. Did, yeah, they played to a, a live army audience yeah uh, of sailors wow. <laughs> the chorus playing to sailors good image yeah. and uh, they and it was great the guy they loved it um uh, i always remember one particular sailor i think he took a fancy to jim and he he wanted to show him 
the guitars that he had. He was a musician himself, so uh, I think he lured Jim away. Uh, but he was he was recaptured quickly by yeah. the band because uh, this guy wanted to show him his guitars and things. But it was a good fun day, and uh, it was a bit surreal being on the ship. I we know. shot all that on film. That wasn't video. We shot that on film camera. Oh. Uh, I, I didn't shoot that. A good friend of mine, Keen the Butler, uh, filmed that. With, and we had the boom, we had the proper sound and everything mm. for that video at that time. So, um, But it was uh, tricky getting on and off the boat. And there was a huge interest from all the sailors that the corps were coming on board yeah. to perform. So it was a really good, exciting gig to do, yeah. You said that they were shot on film. Do you know if the negatives yeah. were ever scanned or anything like that? The negative would have been scanned because you would have always just tell you you wouldn't cut on film. You just transfer immediately to digital. I shot on film just for the quality of film. And it would have been scanned and it would have been scanned in London somewhere mm -hmm. uh, because we wouldn't have that facility in Dublin. I don't know what happened. The original film stuck. So I would have just been concerned about the digital stock which is, who knows where that is. But there would be, there'd be original, there'd be quality uh, footage around somewhere of all of that, I'm sure. Cool. If I were, if I had the time to go through all the course footage, that would be a few months work uh, for somebody to do. <laughs> well, I, I live close enough. Like it's, you know, I could take some time off. I can, <laughs> I can, I can help anytime you yep. need. Was the, was the whole gig filmed? Because we only see a brief, like, hi, welcome, and then it kind of cuts away. I was the only one shooting anything of the, as far as I remember, the only one shooting anything of that gig. So I only shot moments of it because I knew I was shooting for the Love to Love You video, so I couldn't cover a concert. So we didn't, it, would, it was too difficult. No one had mentioned it, but if it was mentioned, it would have been too uh just too much to organize on a battleship to do a concert that's moored in the bay just the it would have been a very just big a nightmare. I, nightmare yeah nightmare yeah, yeah. so yeah and there's um yeah there's a few scenes in one of the what looks like a sort of a a cockpit kind of area yeah. where they're miming i'm assuming to playback they, they mind yeah i would have bought a little tape recorder yeah and just to get them the timing of mm -hmm. to get the lip sync, knowing that in videos, you know, there'll be three seconds of yeah. Andrea in cam in sync. So we just played a little tape back, though so we didn't mind about the key. In those days, the editing and syncing up sound wasn't as easy as it is these days. Mm. So we brought a little tape recorder or a little dictaphone machine or something and just played the track and she sang to it and copied it. Her sync is, Andrea was always brilliant at lip sync anyway. The music videos for years clearly demonstrate that it's uh you know yeah. it's part of the industry it's part of the the whole thing um and it doesn't detract from what they can obviously do but it's just part of that machine yeah. that needs to roll and she rolls with it very well but then her yeah. youth is a testament to singing along to songs so it's i've done i've done lots of little uh, videos with andrea over the years and it'd be quick because time would be precious on her her side so she just come into studio do the track twice do it perfectly, be gone. And that was the way, that's the way it worked. They got, became so pro. And so yeah, yeah. in her, in her solo career, it was like that. So yeah. oh, I didn't realize you worked with her on any of her solo stuff. Mm, yeah. Oh. oh, quite a bit. Yeah. That's... And she wrote a book. She wrote a, I wrote a whole, I wrote a documentary about her book and following her, releasing her book and signing in the warehouse. And the only thing I didn't do was be there when she was writing it. Word for word. No, I did, yeah, we've done a lot of other things that. Oh, that's cool. They just haven't. No one has reason, seen. Yeah. Haven't come out, or they. There's not the right yeah. time to. Or oh, that's yeah. Cool. The, I'm glad that was documented. And charity work. She does a lot of charity work that no one sees, and uh, we shot a few videos for that and things like that. Oh, yeah, that's very cool. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I know that um, she worked with, for her first album. She worked with Styla Rouge, who recorded or yeah. well, there was some recordings of her or uh, acoustically doing some tracks on piano in a in a theater yeah. um but mm. they've ne some of the those were those tracks were released on a few physical cds but the quality is it just atrocious yeah. rob o'connor of style rouge and uh, rupert styles uh, were style rouge and i've worked with those guys i've shot stuff with rob with rob 
Rob has directed one or two things for the course and I've been there shooting him directing those. Yeah, so that was part of our documentary as well, yeah. It's one mad circle. It's, it, it it's is, spaghetti. Yeah. We call it we call it spaghetti was the name of the documentary once days because everything was just so intertwined. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's mad to think. I yeah. I went to I think I I went to a majority of Andrea's and Sharon's um solo gigs worldwide. It was it was mm. wonderful to witness the the kind of fan and and crowd reaction in in different countries and continents and just being like, yeah. wow, this music is adored and accepted world over. Mm. It's beautiful, absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. I find that on my playlist every so often. You just have this random playlist, and when the chorus pop up on it, it just reminds me of how talented how well produced and talented they actually are it's quite it's quite impressive yeah yeah i've got a a few press releases prior to something else in the meantime which is the name of the documentary uh before it came out yeah uh, in uk mm -hmm. press um i know that barry gaster had spoken to press a couple of times regarding it being on its way and being edited the title of it seem to have changed i think initially in the press it was going to be called uh the cause the story so far or something along that kind of line the, mm. the cause the story obviously it's called something else in the meantime referring to sharon's comment near the end of the documentary as oh you know we need to do families we need to do normal stuff yeah. but this mm. is something in the meantime um who's i who came up with that idea and where where did that come from for that title I, it yeah, that title came from Sharon's line in the video that this is what it is. It's just something else in the meantime is what they're doing. You know, that was a, uh, just an interpretation of where they were in their lives at the time. Now, who decided to call it that? Uh, I can't remember. Probably John Hughes, knowing knowing him. Uh, it could have been me said, saying that would be a good title for it. Um, I would, if I had to bet on it, I'd say it was John Hughes who probably said that would be a good mm. name for something else in the meantime. Yeah, there were a couple of names tossed around, the cores, the story, you know, the cores behind the scenes or whatever. But uh, something quirky like that sounded good, something else in the meantime, because it did sum the band up at that time. We were mm. finishing the documentary. You wouldn't have called that at the beginning, of course. But yeah. by the time we got to the edit process, and we didn't know if this was the end, because we've done another one since called All the Way Home. You know, that was mm -hmm. the next chunk of the course. But at that time, they were coming towards the end of something. And nobody really knew. They didn't know themselves. Were they going to finish or take a break or do what? And so this was just something else in the meantime, this story. So that's where it came from. Who decided? I'd say it was John, actually, now that I think back. Yeah. But, it's not, it's yeah. a beautiful title. It really is. As a part homage to that, um, I usually take a, a line or a phrase from whoever I'm interviewing. I usually take one of the lines yeah. or phrases to as the title as the subtitle yeah. for um, the podcast episode each time. So okay. it's kind of like a, a homage back to that kind of, it's yeah, some, it's, yeah. It kind of yeah. gives a snapshot of the flavor of what this is about um, mm. or of the time or what was happening. So that's really interesting. So it's a good, it's a good way to look at it. Yeah. But that Simon in that last seven, 10 years of the life was just something else in the meantime. Yeah. And now what's, the next phase, you know, sure, yeah, what exactly. we're doing now is just something else in the meantime. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, fans through the years of, I don't know if it's incorrect or if ever it was reported as this in, in press or in TV uh, listings, um, that the documentary was called The Right Time Documentary. It could have been. You're, you're reminding me now of the past. I can't remember, was it ever to be called The Right Time uh, I think something else in the meantime came very much after the editing was done. I, I, it was the, it was a last minute dot com decision well, for sure. Funny to uh, say that because the in the edit it's about forty eight minutes long as as I'm sure you're aware. But mm. the it's mm. in the last minute that Sharon has that. So it's the last part of the edit, yeah. the last scene. So mm. it's kind of like oh okay yeah. So it makes sense that it would be later in that editing process in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, and it's always it's nice to explain the title of a documentary somewhere if you can that the name isn't just something that's unrelated. Yeah, so, uh, it does it does relate to, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. 
That's so cool. Yeah, and it took a long time to edit that because there was so much footage on that, and hours and hours. Of... Yeah, I have um, Barry talking to press saying that RTE helped you go through 80 cans of footage. That was RTE's input into it. They wanted to contribute to it in some way and not necessarily financially. So mm. what they do and have done with many documentary makers is to offer them the facility to go into their studios and edit. And of course, your fear then is, well, who is going to be the editor, the in-house editor yeah. that you want to have? So the editor on that, I think it was Ray Roundtree. I it was. Think, yeah. um, and Ray Roundtree was one of the best editors around, a lovely guy. And he and I sat in a dungeon for hours on end going through that. But we had a great time doing it. And uh, RT had a new editing suite built. Oh. And it was the bunker, really. So, uh, so Ray and I went through that in detail. John came in every so often, had a look and changed everything, of course. And then as soon as he went out, we changed it back. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, you know the usual. But, uh, the, the, and that was it. Yeah. So it was a good, it was a good three-way edit. But you can, that's what, these programs are committee decisions. You get so precious about my documentary, you know, you're on a loser. So you have to be open and, and it's always good to have everyone's input. But Ray, as an editor, was perfect, yeah, really good. Yeah. Well, that, that, that was my kind of curiosity, really. It was kind of like, yeah. it has to be a committee because it's it's spanning so much time mm. and you've, you've got yeah. so much footage. How on yeah. earth do you condense that down to... Uh, okay, does this prove the point? Does it prove the point the best yep. out of all the footage we've got? Does it tell mm. the story correctly? Are the band happy with it? Is John happy with it? Yeah. That is, how long did that take, yeah. do you think? It probably took over, a, I would have done an initial edit on it myself because I do some editing. I have some equipment and I just do some basic editing myself. So I did all the initial cutting it down, assembling it and doing it. So that would have taken... In hours, I can't, but it would have been over a period of time and between projects that I would have been, other projects I would have been doing. So it you, it could have taken a year really to edit, you know, over a year, over a period of a year yeah. to edit the whole thing. Yeah. So, uh, and then it, we ended up in RTE finally yeah. doing a chance. So, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I've been in, I've been in their yeah. um, editing suite myself. So, for course so and stuff so yeah yeah it's mad yeah <laughs> it's a full circle again a bit more spaghetti um yeah <laughs> yeah good wow and do any of those original rough edits exist still yeah oh wow i would have a, i would have i would have edits somewhere buried in the dungeon <laughs> at this moment i did uh transfer all the footage of course i had onto a the way the banks uh maintain all their records they have to do that so it has to be available and i put it onto a system like that and i think i believe it's in london somewhere in some firm i hope so uh, that direction yeah. somewhere in a, in a that, in just a behind you in there somewhere yeah in a vault yeah. somewhere uh all the footage should be there available yeah there would be versions of stages of editing available I have a couple of long format videotapes and it just says cores, 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 and I'm not sure what's on what. To one degree, I'm, I'm very glad that it's been like formally, officially backed up um, and it's being held somewhere. That's good. But I'm also glad mm. you have the sort of just VHS stuff as well. Of course, I have a copy of it somewhere on my shelf, my original version of it. Yes. Yeah, that's mad. That's mad, mm. but, wonder, but wonderful. Mm. It's you know, it's it's more mm. of an honouring of the content and preservation mind I have. So yeah, to, but um, do you know if it was only aired in Ireland? Because I know it was being touted as being to be sold for, uh, to different broadcasting companies worldwide. Do you know if it was aired? Yes. Else? Do you know I'm terrible at that because I've been involved in lots of documentaries, and once I've done my thing and directed them or shot them or whatever. I kind of move on to the next project. So I don't know where something else in the meantime has been aired. I'm sure there must be a way to find out because RTE would be good at keeping records of sales and things like that. And yeah. then Warner would have been involved in it as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they would have records, but I actually don't know. 
mm. because I didn't get involved in residuals or royalties. I wasn't involved in any of that. So if I had been involved in royalties and stuff, perhaps I would have had more of an interest in what was happening. So yeah, so I didn't really follow it up, Simon. Yeah. Like I have original copies, so perhaps I should look into that and see who owns what on it, because I don't know who owns what on that, to be honest. Um, yeah. everyone, everyone will claim they own it, of course, you know. Oh, well, of, but, course, uh, of course. Yeah, it happens when you produce stuff and you do stuff and then you watch it go out and you see someone else's name and say, oh, gee, I thought I did that. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens from time to time, yeah. Somebody at the end of the line just said, I'll scrub that name off the blackboard. Wow. Just write this one on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. It does happen. Yeah. It's Can you correct the spelling on good. this? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's different yeah. spelling entirely. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually my name. Exactly, yeah. Oof. That's right. <laughs> Tell me about the incredible Dick Warner and how you got him on board because he has a writing credit on on the commentary yeah. that runs on top of his dialogue. How did he get involved? What, what, what whose brainchild was that? Dick Warner. I knew Dick Warner from my documentary days here in Ireland. He would have had the voice, this deep, mm. resonant voice, beautiful voice, and he had voiced many TV shows here some of which I had shot and I knew him. And I think I remember just thinking one day that he would be great to write some script for this uh, show because he's a script writer and perhaps he could voice it. So initially he wrote script for it mm -hmm. and then he read it and then we just liked him reading it because he had a quirky, dry sense of humour so sometimes yeah. when something's written, when it's written, it really depends on who's reading it mm -hmm. can change the dialogue or the meaning of the dialogue. Yeah. So Dick wrote it and uh, also uh, recorded it. And I thought, we thought it was terrific yeah, at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it, it, it's yeah. beautiful work. And it, it's such a rich, mm. friendly, warm, welcoming, kind of unassuming voice. Mm. It's Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. He loved he loved to play with words. And I'd have to remember, I'm not thinking of anything specific in sure. the documentary, but he used to play with words all the time. And that was nice. You know, he had yeah. He presented a TV show here called Waterways about rivers in Ireland. And he could make you listen to anything, that guy. He was yeah, so good. That's yeah. <laughs> that seems to be the the work he's so well recognized for and that uh, Mm. captured the heart of a whole nation through his audio work on that yeah mm. beautiful yeah do you still have copies of any of his scripts i could have on a hard drive somewhere i have i think possibly simon yeah there could be i do have a selection of cores hard drives of which i try to update every so often because when they sit on a shelf for a while things can happen but uh, i they could well be on a hard drive somewhere yeah but I'm not sure. Was it that if the fact that he just unprompted by you or John just watched the footage back and then tried to tell the story from what he saw? Yeah. From a meeting with him, sit and talked about the idea of the documentary, what we were trying to convey, and from looking at the footage, of course. Then he, he, he took a copy of it and then he wrote having seen the end, the final, or close to the final edit. Because, <laughs> how, do I, how do I address this topic? Um, not everything in the documentary is, is accurate or correct. Am, am, I, am I okay right. to say that? Am I? Yeah, oh, it, like, it's, how do you mean? What, yeah, tell uh, me. Let's, let's take the fact that uh, the documentary shows that the, in the timeline of what was filmed of Gene and Jerry at the airport, it's a big goodbye. They need to, yeah. go, they need to go and record yeah. Forgiven Not Forgotten on their own. They're leaving the nest where yes. Gene and Jerry went with them for the recording of six months in the US to, to record Forgive Not Forgotten and stayed with them while they recorded it. I've spoken to those that were in the studio with them daily and they were like, oh yeah, they, they stayed here. They stayed with the family. Okay. What I'm assuming has happened in the footage is that the footage is actually of their saying goodbye to their parents for talk on corners. And then that was in the timeline of the edit used to illustrate there's the band going off to do record their first album. Whereas thematically it looks amazing and is brilliant, but factually mm, yeah. may not be entirely correct. Are you saying to me that people play with reality in documentaries? 
I, I wouldn't go as far as <laughs> never. To say that. never never they would never, never they would never i don't know <laughs> stretch truths or or yeah. disguise certain things or make things <laughs> appear to look a certain way to yeah. report the band to be better than they are what are you on about and was that the time i'm trying to remember i was there with jerry and jane at the airport filming and you have obviously researched things and have more insight into the wider circle there. And I have no doubt that you are correct. If that's the way it was, though we used, I must have used the uh, them saying goodbye for talk on corners as saying goodbye for forgiven, not forgot. Wasn't that very clever of me? I haven't, I'm not doubting you. I'm sure you're right. Yeah, I'm not mentioning it because, oh, there's this and that's not right. It's more the fact that the commentary seemed to reflect what they were watching rather than what was yeah. the truth. As it were, or, you know, the exact fact. It's more, hi, this is what yeah. this is showing us. Yeah, and I think the fact that I was out in Malibu with them for a period, for two periods in Malibu with them while they were recording, and I don't remember Gene and Jerry being there. They weren't there when I was there. Yeah. But maybe that confused me as well, that they were there. And it was for Forgiven, Not Forgotten, that I was there as well. So, uh, yeah, interesting, mm. yeah. Early on in the documentary, we have a clip of the Secret Life demo video mm. with a, a green screen element. Was that filmed yeah. by yourself, Those that original demo? Yeah. I wow. filmed that. We did that. We did that in a, a studio here in Dublin in a, what was a lighting facility company. And they had a small studio. And I just said, let's do a green screen. It was cheap and cheerful and quick. And it was just a way maybe to add another element into it. We're talking a long time ago when green screen was very cool. Very, very but uh, <laughs> and very difficult to film on green screen. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so, we, yeah, we just put up, I think there were three panels, was there, or one panel of green screen. Uh, Can you remember what, what you were intending to superimpose on that? Because obviously in the footage, we just see the documentary stuff imposed. I hadn't intended to, hadn't a clue what to impose on it. Just said, if you put up a green screen, you can, you can impose anything on it which gives you a lot more choice. Well, that's very sensible and forward thinking. Look how it was used to such great effect, right? It wasn't great. Like, let's be honest, it was fairly basic, but it kind of got a video shot quickly and cheaply. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I should ask you a more a, a broader question. What is your understanding of Bill Whelan's involvement in this period of their development? Bill was... Uh, very influential. We all know Bill Whelan of Riverdance and his amazing music and all of that. Uh, John and Bill were friends at the time. Mm -hmm. Bill produced some of the, was involved in the production of their music in the early days and was quite influential in, I don't know which particular tracks, I can't remember, but Bill was there giving advice and production advice at the time. Mm. Uh, so he, which was before Riverdance, of course, long yeah, before yeah. that. But Bill was Bill was a really respected musician in Dublin at the time. Uh, I had worked with him. He was the piano player in RTE. I used to work in RTE as a cameraman, mm. and uh, Bill was the the session musician on the piano. But between takes, Bill would just play his own stuff. Uh, and entertain wow. us camera crew and everything. He was an amazing musician, but. So Bill was there uh, because he knew John, and I think he produced a good few tracks. Because he's not credited anywhere, it's very hard to kind of nail down exactly how much influence and, and to what regard. I have memories of some performance they gave. It could have been in Whelan's pub in Dublin. You said the waterfront was their first game, yes. and I was mistaken it with uh, Whelan's pub. And I know Bill was influential in the Whelan's pub gig, and he was there on the night. Yeah. And uh, he would have made a lot of suggestions musically to the band in the early days. Which tracks, I don't know. Bill would have appeared maybe in odd time in the studio. They might be rehearsing a very occasionally. He might have just been in the background, come in. Perhaps he was in the studio for another reason as well. I might have popped in or something like that. Mm -hmm. I do remember seeing him there a few times, but I don't remember filming anything with Bill, no. I did film for a tribute to John later on in his apartment in Paris and a few other people who were paying tribute to John later on. He won an award for any music yeah. award, I think. But that was the only time with Bill, yeah. 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 And Riverdance, of course, I... I was director of Calgary and River Dance and Radio City and did all of that with uh, Bill at the time. So, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Incredible. 
yep. incredible life. Yep. Another um, life story, river dance for me, having spent years with that same thing with the core. I get into these long term projects. They go on for years, the documentaries I've been involved in. So yeah. So it must be incredibly rewarding though to look yeah. back and see that that collective work bits here bits there over yeah. years of period culminates in something so rich a tapestry yes it's a nightmare to edit hours and hours <laughs> yeah. a year yeah. another year of your life just to edit um but you can look yeah. back and see such a rich tapestry of what you now know from fandom is is dearly loved by the fan community yeah. it must be wonderful to be like I'm yeah. glad I bothered. I'm I'm glad I bothered because yeah. it's to, to yeah. us fans, it's a historic moment of the band. See, I had no awareness of that. I said it to John many times. John knew as we'd be with the band and they'd be playing and they'd be in front of an audience, massive audiences, and I'd film whatever I'd be filming. I had no idea, and still to this day, don't feel this is a great band at all. Or it's just an ordinary day's work, really. Yeah, and to be with them and I you forget that when you're there or you're behind the scenes or you're they're getting ready to go on stage and you're filming something and you're just chatting it's there's nothing special really in what I was doing just pointing a camera and carrying on that's the way I always saw it and occasionally it dawned on me my god this these are a pretty successful band here we're dealing with but they never they never made anyone feel like they were a special band because no. they're just so easy to be with. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so you were never in the way. I do remember Andrew saying, Kieran, take the camera away. <laughs> Kieran, is the camera gone? Kieran, you're not filming, are you? <laughs> is that camera still there? And she laughed then, you know, so that's the way it was. And of course, there were times when it, it wasn't right for the camera to be there. So you just, sure. you walk away and you say, forget it. Of course, obviously, but you had that kind of trust from them. So um, it was, uh, I never felt you were dealing with an important band or musicians, you know, they, they never conveyed that. Yeah. yeah, you need somebody that's going to be provenly level-headed, that it's, you know, this isn't a, yeah. oh, I need to capture this. It's just a, hi, yeah. we're on this journey together. I'm part of a, yeah. a, very, a very needed cog in this wheel. We're all turning together this promotional beast um let's go on this ride so but to be there from the early days that's what a huge level of trust there did come a point where things began to get busy now this band has taken off here and things are going well so we decided then that i'd kind of do a two-day retainer kind of thing uh, over a period of years and we just decided i'll be available i'll make myself available for on average two days a week a year that kind of arrangement very loose there might be weeks where I wouldn't be or there wouldn't be anything happening. We did we we established that for a while and that worked quite well. So so it was it was an understanding between myself and John that I would be available to shoot that and I would make myself available to shoot things in. So yeah, mm. so it was great. Some of the early press releases saying that the documentary was coming said that it also included some footage of Andrea falling over on the warship. Could you enlighten us more on that? It was a really windy day on the ship. Uh, there were ladders to be climbed. Mm. They had to get off boats onto boats. Uh, really windy out on the deck. Uh, we walked the deck a few times just for good shots to be out in the front. Uh, I think uh, Andrea had to stumble, all right? Just stumbled. Yeah. As I think we all stumbled that day because it was so windy and wild. And... Uh, it's not something you'd want to put into a video because why do that? You know, I mean, what do you want to make somebody look silly like or catch idiot. them out? That's yeah, yeah that's that, yeah. Or it was a bit of fun. I'm sure she laughed when it happened. If I can remember, but why would you want to put it in? I might have gotten in in an early edit or something that uh, I wouldn't have been physically editing that in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I would tend to give stuff to an editor and they just work away on it and then you come in and see what they offer. It's always good to do that because then somebody else has a different view. But maybe that's where it came from. But uh, So we just take those kind of things out immediately. Yeah. There were skirts flying everywhere and all that. So we just say, let's cut all that out of it. You know, you don't, you, we don't need it yet. So, yeah. Not that I speak for fans, but I think fandom has appreciated the fact that that has been 
the case and that harkens back to as we spoke to earlier to that um mm. you know the decency that john wants to purport in yeah. uh, marketing the band you, you know it's yeah. everything's decent everything's uh yeah controlled in, yeah. A, in a really yeah. lovely protective and wholesome way yeah. so yeah and the girls and jim would be very aware of it too and andrew totally aware of it themselves you know it wasn't just john telling them you have to be the, they, they were all on the same sheet i think yeah mm. We have footage in the documentary of Little Wing being recorded with the Chieftains in Dublin. Mm. Were you there for that? Actually, I was, yeah. Paddy oh. Maloney in Windmill Lane and uh, yeah. the Coors. Yeah. I was there. Did I film it? Uh, I do have a memory of Brian Masterson was the sound engineer in window for that, I think. Um, whom I can see in the back of my mind. I can see. I've been in, you see, I've been in Windmill Lane many times with other bands mm. doing things and the cores and the chieftains um i can i don't think i filmed that no i thought terrible not to remember these things but uh, well it's been a long time mm. it's been a long time it's been a long time yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you finished the documentary does your filming then finish with them and their rise from then onwards because obviously you're credited no. on lansdowne road no, my filming carried long on after that. I produced and directed Lansdowne Road. They were doing the show and we knew in advance that it was all going to happen and John had decided that, and they all decided they were going to do this show. And a couple of weeks before the show, John asked me, "Would I put? could I put together the filming of the show? Hmm. and would it be possible to do it and we i said thanks for the warning like it's like two weeks in advance or something <laughs> these kind of things can take a lot of time to get crews together anyway i said yes and we shot it all on film film got 11 film cameras uh shot that the director who i had lined up i was producing pulling the whole thing together the filming of it all together uh, the director I had had hummed and hawed and at the last minute dropped out. So I directed him, the, wow. which I didn't want to do, but I did. And it was fine. It all worked out fine because with 11 film cameras, a, a roll of film lasts for 10 minutes in a camera. That's the maximum you can put into a 16 millimeter film camera. And every 10 minutes, you have to change the roll. So you have to coordinate the changing of magazines and film mm. every 10 minutes with 11 cameras. And then that magazine has to go somewhere and be unloaded so it can be reloaded and put it. So it was quite a logistical nightmare in amongst a crowd of 40,000 people uh -huh. in Lansdowne in a venue with cameras everywhere. So it was a bit of a, a bit of an ordeal, but we did it and we pulled it off and uh, all the crew on it were amazing. The guys who was the director of photography on that shoot was a guy called Peter Robertson who shoots Vikings. Uh, PJ Dillon was one of the camera guys. He shoots Game of Thrones now. Um, and these guys are top of their game. And I, when I look at the credits, I haven't done it recently, they look at the list of credits on the Lansdowne Roadshow, I, I really get a tickle because the names on the camera department on that show are the top end guys. They're shooting all these big shows. They're all the camera crews that work on these things now so they're brilliant yeah so it was uh, it was a really special event that one for me to do that and um, so i had to rope in a colleague late in the day to come in and give me a hand to do it a guy called john mcdonald who's a well-known producer here in ireland and uh, he pulled it off Sunny autumn day, it's still 
Yes, and then then the uh, we got it done. Uh, we had one little problem in that the camera that was the close up for Andrea on the show, her big close up, a 600 mil lens from further back in the crowd had a little shake on the stand because people decided to climb up on the stand and the security guys that we had organized didn't do their job. So I had to stabilize a lot of it, which is a bit costly, but it worked out fine. But the, the coverage of that show, I think, is terrific. And uh, the band are amazing. And we decided to do it that there were no cameras in shot as little as possible. Yeah. Sometimes you get cameras everywhere in the back of close-ups mm -hmm. and it could be quite distracting. So we worked hard to with the crew to keep them out of shot and do all that kind of thing. So, And it was with live screens on, on mm -hmm. the show as well. So you couldn't shoot shots because... You yeah. had to do it real for real. So it was um, it was quite a task, but it was really an exciting one to do. And I was kind of delighted with the end result. That got edited in London and um, it was uh, put together. But then, of course, the editor at the end of it gets their name on as if they've produced a show. Yeah. So there's a name or two. Uh, there's a name or two on that one that had nothing to do with last in a row. Didn't ever were at the venue, but wow. of course they did it. A little bit of that. But it was a great show to do, really good show to do. And uh, I was delighted. John asked me, I was kind of cursing him and thanking him at the same time. So, But he had a budget and he paid the money and it was great. And we went down the day after and we sat everyone down in a pub and we paid them all the next day, every oh, one of them. I was wonderful. never doing that because I would be a cameraman working on shoots where you fight for ages. And we paid them well and they all got it the next day and it was a great experience, the whole thing. Yeah. So, But uh, technically it was a challenge, but nice to do it on film and all that film footage is somewhere i don't know where it is but it's in london somewhere in somebody's bin probably well it... <laughs> but we have it all we have it all on digital you know so has the negs been scanned up to blu-ray resolution let's say no got transferred onto probably beta cam or something or our digital some form of digital at that time whatever was available and nothing else i haven't done anything with it since then so it's all there somewhere. It being 16 mil, that means you can get up to, what, 8K out of that? Yeah, there would be no reason to do anything more with it than what we've done, really, you know, because uh, you wouldn't re-edit it or do it again. It's you wouldn't re-edit it. Really. I guess future generations, preservation and playback, the possibilities there to get an enhanced mm. quality version out there for, for yeah. modern monitors and modern physical media and, yeah. That's the reason you shoot on film, yeah. is to maintain as the high quality as possible, yeah. Mm. It's a beloved concert, mm. and it's it's one that fans return to again mm. and again and again, and how could they not? It's beautiful. It was called The Homecoming, yeah, and it was a special time in their career, very special time to come back to the play to their own. But it was even more important than coming back to Dundalk in the early days, playing to their school teachers and playing to their friends, which was more of a nightmare for them, I think, than 40,000 in Lansdowne Road. But, uh, and that comes across. It's, you know, I think that vulnerability mm. with those that you know so well uh, and of, uh, you know, mm. their expectations, preconceptions, all of that is is there. Whereas a mm. faceless 40,000 people, you yeah, it's it's its own different type of nerves, I'm sure. I, what would I know? But um, a different nerve, exactly. Different yeah, nerve. yeah. When you look into an audience and you see your your school teacher or your bank manager sitting in front of you, there, it's different, isn't it? Or your friend that you had. In <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. Tell me yeah. of how you were approached for all the way home. All the way home. Well, we had finished something else in the meantime. Mm. We, John and I. We just were friends, so we would have seen each other on an ongoing basis, you know. So um, it's not as though somewhere out of the blue you get a call. It's just the cores would have been doing lots of other things in between, which I would have filmed. So it was just a continuous journey. It wasn't now here we go with uh, All the Way Home. So All the Way Home was just a continuation. It was another thing in the meantime, really. Mm. Uh, all the way home just let's carry on filming this band is a, a success and we just keep shooting John was great for that he was always wanted events to be captured you know yeah and in the meantime he, he was doing other things with other musicians as well that mm -hmm. people don't know about but we filmed I filmed them as well other artists that were doing things and John was producing his own album of music yeah which was 
lovely stuff and I was mm. filming that as well so I was just non-stop really with the band uh, during that period I felt like non-stop mind you I was doing other things and earning a living and doing all that sure. so uh, but we just carried on into that next project really yeah it's amazing it, it, it was so cool to suddenly mm. see yeah similar or certain parts of that footage and was it a i'm assuming it has to be a completely different editorial team and project yeah. manager regarding that footage yeah i loosely would have been editing sections of that as we were going because it was intermittent again over another period of what four or five years maybe was it i'm yeah. not sure how long it was but it would have been four or five years so i would have ingested edited a bit film more yeah so it was it was an or very organic process as these documentaries are that i do very organic and uh then the uh the final edit warner vision were involved in financing all of that mm. and they bought the whole lot at the end they liked it i had just run it myself and john just mm -hmm. did it we just did it nobody had commissioned anything <laughs> and said, what are we going to do with this is there another documentary in this i said no, i think so let's try and edit and see what comes out and that's what came out Wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. That, I must look at it again now. It could, you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's not a, a mid 90s or a late 90s music industry going, oh, okay, let's do that. Or, oh, okay, yeah, go and do the music mm. video. That's, a, that's not mm. that many years ago, current music industry going, mm. oh, yeah, no, you've got something there. You've, you've, that's the you yeah. nail on the head. Let's use that. That was the same with Riverdance and John and Moya. Moya, I had worked with them. They had a, a video company and they just said, uh, we're going to do this show. It's called Riverdance. We don't know, will it be successful or not, but would you be interested in shooting or directing a documentary about it? We don't have any money at the moment to pay you, but if if it does come about, we'll, we'll see what we can do and we'll pay you for a day, your daily yeah. work, of course. And I said, okay, this sounds interesting. And Riverdance in the Riverdance and I ended up in New York another journey for a couple of years intertwined with the course so mm. I got involved in that kind of work style pattern in those days so um but the course yeah they just it just was one seamless journey with the course really for 20 years Andrea signed her book for me she released her book and she signed it in the shop on the first day of the book being launched she said to Kieran or something who has been following, following, hanging out or following around for the last 20 years or something like that. And yeah. love Andrea. But uh, so that was kind of summed it up for me. I didn't realize it was 20 years working with the course. Yeah. And, and that's, <laughs> that's why I had to at least try and contact you. You know, it's, it's, mm. um, it's an integral part of the yeah. cult that's yeah. influenced to whatever degree everything we've seen mm. visually from the band since day mm. one. So how yeah. could I not, yeah. right? How could I not? It's, I, I had to at least yeah. try. Mm. Is there anything that you would expect me to ask that I haven't asked? Or any memories, specific memories of the band that you think, oh, that's a cool thing to, to comment about that nobody knows? No, really, just for the band's sake, it was such a pleasure to work with and just such a talented group. And it was such a pleasure to be able to experience them produced the kind of music they did as a five member group with John being the fifth member, mm -hmm. uh, that it was just a pleasure to be around them and the, the privilege really, I mean, to be there for the journey. Thank you so much for your memory. I am amazed at how much you've been able to recall uh, with my very mild prompting of just the decades of filming and the projects you've worked alongside with the cause, um, but particularly the documentary and the love to love you music video it's been so wonderful to be able to touch base and finally put a face to a name and see the other side of the camera at long last um in footage that the, the fan community have loved for now decades thank you so much for being so willing and candid um with your comments and your recollections it's been truly wonderful you're very welcome and thanks for sparking my memory too <laughs> it's a, a wonderful time and memories to treasure for sure you're a good interviewer. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, you're natural. Yeah, well done. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Good luck. Thanks, bye. Again, a huge thank you goes to Kieran for spending his time and being so frank and open about what it was like to work with the band for many decades.
It was truly insightful and, I have to say, one of my most enjoyable interviews to date. I'd love to give another mention to the thousands of listeners now throughout the world. It's always amazing and so encouraging to see the different countries that people are listening from each and every day. If you haven't gone back and heard any of the previous episodes, you'll find that a lot of these episodes and interviews are informed by the previous episode in the series. And season one covering Forgiven Not Forgotten is now 13 episodes long. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to any episodes you may have missed previously to this one. Please like and subscribe and leave a review on the platform you're currently listening on. If you're listening via YouTube, please feel free to drop a comment and I'll do my best to get back to you. The podcast also has a Discord, which you'll find in the show notes, as well as now an email if you want to get in touch directly. Email address being causecast at icloud.com. I'm excited to produce more episodes and there has been several interviews in the last several weeks that I will edit into future episodes for this season alone and there's been a few tentative steps towards the beginnings of season two. Again, a huge thank you for listening and you've been listening to Causecast.